Okay, uh, so as mentioned, I want to give a little bit of updates of what the QC Archive team has been up to in the past six months. Um, specific updates with open forest fields and some just general infrastructure updates as well that may be interesting to this particular crowd. Um, so I thought to begin with is we, we go back over the, the goals of the QC Archive project to see kind of like where we're coming from and, and why we're moving in certain future directions. Um, so first of all, fundamentally what we are is a, a platform for generation storage of massive sets of training data um, or, or just general computations for either machine learning um, or for benchmarking. But effectively, it's always about um, organizing and storing quantum data at scale, making sure all the relations are there so we can always find adjacent quantum data, um, and then displaying uh, quantum data that is, is, is simple and easy to use. Um, that's fundamentally what we're really after. Um, I think the, the third point that we, we talk about a lot is that you know, ultimately what we want QC Archive to turn into is going to be a place where you can mine quantum chemical data, which will inform day-to-day -day molecular analysis and sign. Um, obviously, this is a, a much more tall tree than the first two points, which are fairly simple to do, um, but I believe we've made a little bit of progress in this area, and I'd like to share that uh, to you today. Um, and then finally and fundamentally, um, like all open force fields, uh, software infrastructure, we are an open source ecosystem. Um, which is both guided by the community and also developed by the community these days, um, where we've had uh, over 35 external contributors um, across the entire software stack. Um, so to, to focus really on generation of machine learning data, um, what we kind of view is a very simplified machine learning pipeline like so. Um, you know, first of all, you choose the molecules from your training set, you want to calculate energies and properties, um, you want to get those energies and properties, combine them with your futurization sets, and then finally do your analysis and potentially publish papers, models, and data. Um, and when we look at this, what we say is in, within this pipeline, what are the things that you know, we can actually help out with? What are the things that we can standardize and canonicalize to make it easier to form this pipeline? Um, and our end answer was the, the following boxes. Um, so first, making sure that generation of quantum chemistry data across different methods and basis sets, um, and even programs, is as seamlessly as possible. Um, so in this top box up here, we actually have um, the computation of uh, Omega B97X with the Sci4 program um, on the QM3 data set. Um, and also for comparison, uh, the ability to compute, for example, Torchani through or any one x um, through, through the same exact QM3 data set. Um, and in this way, we should be able to be able to homogenize the ability to do arbitrary computations on, on these large data sets. Um, in the bottom right-hand corner, we can then get these properties back, for example, into a pandas data frame or CSV file or whatnot, um, which will allow um, very easy labeling of the data. Um, of course, you know, futurization is going to be extremely bespoke these days, so you can uh, do an individual combination with bespoke workflows um, but for different kinds of futurizations. Um, then, of course, the two other areas where we believe we can help out is both publishing the computational model um, and being able to hook this into a larger ecosystem, um, as well as publishing the data um, in a place where it's going to be in a, in a standardized format and also easily available um, to the rest of the quantum chemistry or other uh, communities. Um, in particular, our enhancements uh, for this uh, particular machine learning workflow. Um, so we really radically improved the performance for very large molecule data sets. So handling million, million molecule data sets is not a problem um, for, for kind of like the machine learning side of things. Um, we now have the ability to export these very large data sets in HDF5 format. Um, we've also added a bunch of tutorials and examples using QC Archive uh, to kind of get up quickly into speed to be able to generate this data um, quickly and easily. Um, and we've also looked deeply into storing wave function information. So if you want to store, say, orbitals or densities or even Fock matrices, um, we can now do that as well and present them to you in a very similar way of, you know, here's the pandas table of numpy arrays. Um, if you go to the link at the top, um, you can explore uh, all these examples and more, um, trying to show you how to kind of get up to speed and quickly um, interacting and generating uh, quantum chemistry data. Um, the other two things that we've been working on, which I'll actually talk a little bit about later, um, but one, we have a new quantum chemistry machine learning database where you can deposit um, all of your data as mentioned, um, and I'll give like a little demo of that. Um, and we also uh, have made it a bit easier to add new machine learning models to QC Archive um, using kind of something like Torch Annie as an example of what this should look like. 
Um, so that's the primary machine learning workflow. And then also we'd like to talk a little bit about uh, workflows with open force field. Um, so here we have kind of a, a different set of computations required. With something like open force field, we of course are not interested in single energies or single gradients, um, but we're actually more interested in complicated values. Um, so Haya was showing off, for example, the torsion drive computations and the results from them within the QC archive. Um, so far, open force fields computed about 4,800 of them. Um, a new and upcoming thing that we've been looking at, uh, for example, is the ability to um, engage, uh, for example, uh, workflows to handle nitrogen inversion centers, which has, required, which has re requested um, a new service called a grid optimization, which effectively does a constrained scan um, over, for example, uh, you know, is, is a given nitrogen center inverted or not, and we're able to provide um, effectively uh, energy surfaces from that. Um, so far, we've run about 1,300 of them. Um, I suppose we'll, we'll probably get an update from the results of those computations um, fairly soon as well. Um, we've moved over to Docker-based images and Conda environment-based uh, images for uh, containerizing open force field computational resources to ensure the distributed computing framework um, gives you back reliable results, um, always with the exact same version, um, and then ensuring that there's no issues with, say, updating and the like. Um, and that, in turn, I think has really given rise to uh, a pretty high level of uptime and compute scalability. Um, I believe Jeff is going to add a little bit of, of, of um, information about how open force fields computational requirements have scaled up um, by, say, five to ten fold over the past couple of weeks to meet um, the demands for the upcoming force field. Um, so all told, this is um, about 11 million gradient evaluations with another 51,000 Hessian computations um, computed so far for open force field. Um, to kind of give you an idea of the, the total scale of, of compute involved with this particular project. Um, I believe this came to something like 2 million core hours or so. Um, so it's, it's becoming a, a decent amount and we've, we've ensured that there's enough headroom that we can scale up by another order of magnitude pretty easily. Um, I think the other thing to point out here is the Q, there, our open force field is a QC archive sponsor. Um, so everything that we do is um, open source, but um, sponsorship really helps uh, guide the efforts to the, of the QC archive uh, in terms of capabilities and, and uh, data online. Um, one thing that I do want to point out that uh, is, is, I think, is neat and combines both um, benchmarking with regard to force fields and also benchmarking with regard to machine learning models um, is that we've been extending QC Engine to include AI energy evaluation and force fields as well. Um, so for example, here is an op geometry optimization um, schema input um, for the Sci4 program with a given uh, level of theory. So this is a mega banana 7 x d um, In this case, we, we should have added a basis set, but um, to give you an idea here. Um, and of course, you get the, the geometry back out after this optimization. Um, if we want to switch out something like Tortani, it's going to be a single line where instead of calling Sci4, we want to compute Tortani with the any one method. Um, and then something that we've been adding and is, is worked by a lot of open force field scientists, um, for example, is the ability to do something like running Smirnoff um, through this exact same framework. Um, and so what this will do is this will really give rise to the ability to give a perfect one-to-one -one comparison. Um, we're always running the exact same uh, workflow uh, for all the different backends, um, which will ensure that we get um, a very apples-to-apples -apples comparison um, when we start benchmarking things like Smirnoff 99 Frost um, and, and, and similar uh, force fields that are coming out. Um, so, so this is coming soon. Um, we're pretty excited about this to be able to automatically generate benchmark data, not only for quantum, but also for, for different force fields as well. Um, I just want to talk about some, some general improvements. Uh, so I think one thing that's uh, both like a little bit scary, but also really neat was we actually had our first drive failure um, on Volsi's old hardware. And uh, what this caused was, was actually um, a complete database loss. Um, but fortunately, we were able to uh, give rise to uh, all the backups. Um, all this worked flawlessly, and we we're actually able to restore within about 20 hours. Um, and when we did this restore, we actually uh, migrated to a new server, which we were planning to anyways. Um, and the new server has about five years of scalability built into it. Um, and I think most importantly is now the, the primary database is resilient to individual drive failures. So we can actually lose um, a couple drives uh, on the new server without anything going down and not having to do a full backup restore. 
Um, on top of this, it kind of highlighted that 20 hours is probably a little bit long. So we instituted new hourly, nightly, and monthly backup strategies um, to further limit data loss and improve recovery time. Um, so before we lost about six hours of compute and took us about 20 hours to come back up. Um, in the future, we should only lose about an hour of compute um, and the recovery time should be more likely on the, on the order of an hour timeline. Um, so we're pretty excited about this. Um, it, it, we're talking about this because it was kind of a highlight of, you know, how important this kind of thing is and making sure that um, the backup and the security is there and kind of our, our first um, pass at this kind of guarantee uh, actually worked without a hitch. So we're, we're, we're very happy about that. Um, more software-based improvements is we've been making um, basically everything faster. So the ability to add um, you know, tens or hundreds of thousands of molecules at the same time is now much, much quicker, um, you know, by about a factor of 50. Uh, so, so all kinds of creations and operations within QC Archive are much faster. Um, in addition, we've been adding custom queries um, to the database so that you can, for example, get all the final molecules in a torsion drive um, in a much, much shorter amount of time as well. So overall, just doing a lot of performance enhancements. Um, another thing that we've been focusing on is the ability to have insight into what the current server is doing. Um, so we're logging lots of information about what are the computational resources and the current server state. Um, so for example, we can say, um, you know, the open force fields compute resources um, currently has this many cores and this many failures over time. And, you know, we, we, can, we can look, you know, very, very detailed um, about uh, this so that we can kind of give uh, information feedback um, to these groups much faster. Um, and to help with this amount of data that we're starting to log and store, um, there's gonna be a new server-side dashboard so you have like a, a graphical GUI um, way of navigating this kind of state and, and maintenance information. Um, so if you wanna make, for example, say like new users or the like, um, everything can be GUI-based rather than CLI-based as it is right now. Um, and I just want to say this is a very small fraction of the software enhancements um, that we've been really working on over the past six months. Um, I think we have uh, combined 200 pull requests um, from a few dozen contributors um, during this time period. Uh, so, so things are, are moving really quite rapidly, which is great. Um, and so I wanted to, to bring back to, to bring up a new thing that we've been working on, which is, you know, how can we use this archive uh, chemical data to kind of inform day-to-day -day molecular analysis and design? Um, you know, again, this is obviously something that's much more complicated and, and much more nebulous than the previous two goals. Um, but I just want to demonstrate two ways we've been approaching this. Um, so first is uh, the ability to do different kinds of web applications. Um, so for example, this is uh, the web application for showing machine learning data. Uh, so you can kind of look at effectively every single machine learning uh, quantum chemistry data set there is. We've curated them all. Um, we've put them into a homogeneous format where you can either get the HDF5 or CSV-like files for this. Um, and we've allowed you to kind of search through these things as the number grows, kind of ordering them in different ways and trying to figure out um, what the common chemical elements are for these things. Um, so we've made a lot of uh, agreements with the, the generators of these data sets so that um, the data sets are published um, online at QC Archive uh, concurrently with being uh, exported to something like uh, Zenodo or Figshare or the like. Um, so, we're, so we're able to have kind of like the central resource and central place of finding um, all these data sets if you're interested in that. Um, another one that we're doing is interactive uh, ways of plotting and looking at uh, various statistics. Um, so in this particular case, what we do is we're pulling out um, a variety of curated data sets. Um, so in the quantum chemistry world, uh, for example, it's fairly popular to take um, one of about 30 different um, molecules or reactions um, that are kind of well-known in the literature and do different kinds of DFT or basis sets comparisons for them. Um, and so what we've done is we've gone through and we've, we've, we've recomputed all of these that we can find. Um, and we've recomputed them to make sure that they're, they're kind of on a standard footing and we have a whole bunch more metadata um, about what, what they actually describe. Um, and what this web app allows you to do is slowly and interactively choose a data set, then build out um, the method that you want to display um, and, and in various ways. So if you want to look at bar or violin plots, if you want to do different group buys um, or different methods or basis sets, um, you can interactively explore things. Um, so we think this is going to be, um, you know, a really cool direction for something like the QC archive to go in because we're able to continuously drill down and deliver, um, you know, what is historically in papers, but now just online and can be accessible in a couple of clicks. Um, not really shown here, but you can also explore all the molecules in the data set. So, you know, instead of this kind of S22 esoteric name, 
um, we can actually see you know what's in there, all the different um, molecules that, that comprise of it. And I think um, the thing that's going to be really neat that once we get to is we're going to actually be able to compare time to solution. Um, so for example, here we have different basis sets and um, you know going from DEF2 SVP all the way up to AUGCCP VTZ um, is going to be you know dramatically more costly, you know, perhaps by a factor of 10. Um, and so what we kind of hope to do is be able to give you a plot um, where we give you accuracy versus performance. Um, so you can make much more informed decisions on top of just what is the, the most um, accurate method that there is, because um, that's not the only metric that people care about. Um, I want to throw this slide up here one more time, just as a simple note that um, we continuously have even more partners that we're interacting with. We're seeing an increased number of downloads of all the software stack. Um, we're getting even more computations in from groups like Open Force Field and even more uh, external contributors. Um, so, so things are, are definitely um, growing, I'd say, at a, at a pretty steady pace. Um, and then finally, what I'd like to do is thank everyone involved with this project. Um, it is such a, such a huge um, group and collaboration of people that, that, really, that really work on this and, and make this project work. Um, so really, a thank you to the huge community. Um, thank you to Open Force Field for working with us and, of course, Molsi for sponsoring the project in the first place. Thank you for your time.